everybody, episode 767 of the podcast of the Swing America, the Air Tour Sports Podcast. It is Monday, September 18th, 2023, people. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody enjoyed an awesome Saturday in college football. Don't let them tell you there are bad Saturdays, meaningless Saturdays, bad games. No, 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 no. Perfect example. This Saturday rocked. Fun episode of the uh, 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 fun Saturday of college football, which now leads, of course, to the fun Monday episode of the Air Tour Sports Podcast. Pretty straightforward show today. We're going to open Alabama. They do not look good. What's wrong and can it be fixed? Because I'm not sure that it can be. From there, quick break. We will talk about the rally in Boulder, Colorado. Colorado comes back to be Colorado State. Then from there, we'll get to the rest of college football. I thought Florida was very, very, very impressive in their win over Tennessee. Uh, Georgia beat South Carolina. I actually thought Ohio State looked pretty good in a dominant win over Western Kentucky. Ohio State, of course, playing at Notre Dame next weekend. So, busy show, fun show. Should mention, by the way, speaking of next weekend, crazy jam-packed slate, Clemson, Florida State, Oregon, Colorado, Ohio State, Notre Dame. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. We'll be doing some bonus content on the YouTube channel. Obviously, our normal schedule on the Aaron Torres pod. By the way, if you are watching Monday's show here on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure to like this video. Helps us with that little YouTube algorithm and helps this show continue to blow up. Thank you to Ed for everybody for their support. I mean, the numbers relative to last September are through the roof. Cannot thank you all. With that said, let's not waste any more time. And let's get to the topic of the day. And the topic of the day, bluntly, look, I think we could have started a few different places. I think we could have started with the Colorado-Colorado State game. I think we could have even started with Florida-Tennessee. But where I want to put my focus is in beautiful Tampa, Florida, where Alabama played the weird true road game, non-Power 5 opponent. What a weird, weird scheduling quirk. But Alabama was at South Florida, and bluntly, on paper, this was the get-right game. This was in dating parlance. This was the slump buster, right? It was all bad against Texas last week. Nothing went right. You lose by double figures. Everybody's worried. Is Jalen Milrow the guy? Well, on Friday, we find out that Tyler Buckner is going to get the start. You're playing a bad team. You're playing on the road. Everything is going to go right uh, in this game. And instead, it was the exact opposite. Weird game, weird, you know, camera angles when the weather went bad. They couldn't, the cameramen couldn't be in the camera booth, whatever. But it was just a strange game. But somehow, it somehow looked worse for Alabama. This was the crazy part. We were worried about the quarterbacks. We were worried about the offense. Well, did you see Alabama on Saturday? They finished. I want to make sure I get these stats right because they're really bad. They finished a combined 10 of 23 passing, 107 yards. Tyler Buckner, who replaced Jalen Milrow and was supposed to be the savior, gets benched. Ty Simpson comes in. He looked good, but it was still ugly. Now, to Alabama's credit, they did hold on. They did rally. And late in the game, they were able to run the ball to seal the victory. But in the final game, before SEC play starts next week, you wanted to get right. You wanted to have momentum. Instead, you have so many more questions, and bluntly, I don't know if there are answers to those questions. So let's get into it. Let's break it down, um, and let's let, let's do kind of a, a full 365-degree look at Alabama right now. What went right Saturday? What went wrong? And most importantly, how did we get there, and how did we get here, and can this be fixed? Now, in terms of what went right, I want to give credit, right? Because I, when Alabama ended up sealing up that victory, I thought it was all doom and gloom, terrible, everything, the sky is falling, the worst thing that ever happened. Well, one thing I said after the Texas game, I said, everybody's saying that it's last year all over again, but without Bryce Young. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, there were a few positives from the Texas game. And one of them I actually thought was the defense. Now you look at it, you say they gave up 34 points to Texas. How can that be possible? Well, the bottom line is, as I said last week, Alabama actually had the lead in the fourth quarter against Texas. They only gave up 13 points through three quarters. Then the dam broke. Then Jalen Milrow threw a pick. I mean, it was just so, so, so bad late. 
But Alabama's defense kept them in that game two weeks ago. And I bring it up because if there's one positive coming out of that game, I actually think this defense is pretty good. I actually think this defense is tough. I think this defense makes plays. And listen, I get it. It's South Florida. Alabama should be able to limit what they do. South Florida is not good. They have a quarterback who is very inaccurate and is mostly a runner. But at the end of the day, whenever you hold a team, an opponent, to three points like Alabama did, to a total of, what am I looking at here, 264 yards of total offense. When you're looking at a scenario where you have 10 tackles for loss, five sacks, I don't care who the opponent is. That's good, and I give the defense credit because they came on the field every single possession for basically three and a half quarters, and if they didn't make plays, Alabama could have lost that game. For people who didn't see it, let me be abundantly clear. That was a game that Alabama could have lost. They held on, and it was in large part because of the defense. So that's the positive that came out of the Saturday, out of Saturday. But here's the bad news. Pretty much everything else stinks, and most specifically, the offense stinks. And it doesn't matter how good the defense is because it's not 1968. You can't win every game 17 to 3 or 14 to 3 or 10 to 3. And that offense is really, really, really bad. And the schedule is about to get much tougher as we head into SEC play. When it comes to the offense, look, I'll be honest. I, a couple things stand out. One, I think everybody's kind of focused on the quarterback position. How did we get here? Tyler Buckner's not the answer. If we're being honest, and this was something I talked about on my radio show Saturday night with Jason Martin, Tyler Buckner was ultimately recruited over at Notre Dame. The second that Notre Dame season ended a year ago, it was abundantly clear that he wasn't good enough and Marcus Freeman was going to upgrade. They did in Sam Hartman. So I bring it up because the quarterback play was not good. I think I saw a little bit from Ty Simpson, five of seven passing, really the only explosive play of the game. He hit uh, uh, CJ Dupree, the wide, uh, the tight end transfer up the middle. But I'll be honest, I also think this about the Alabama offense, and I think it's a conversation that people are having, but let me be clear here. I don't think it really matters who the quarterback is at this point. The offensive line was so bad in pass protection that I don't know if it, if you had Caleb Williams or Drake May or Patrick Mahomes or Trevor Lawrence, I don't know that it would matter with the offensive line playing the way that it is. And so I think that's interesting. I think it's worth noting. And that to me is the root of the problem. After an off season where Alabama kept saying, we're going to be more physical. We're going to be more tough. We're going to be this. We're going to be that. They aren't. They can't pass protect. The run game didn't get going until super late when I think South Florida's defense was just exhausted. And again, when you go into SEC play, I don't know how you, if you, let me put it this way. If you can't handle South Florida's pass rush, good luck against LSU, good luck against Texas A&M, good luck against whoever you're going to play. Because everybody in the SEC, respect to South Florida, has better personnel than South Florida. And that, to me, is the root problem. You could talk about quarterbacks. You could talk about Tyler Buckner. You can talk about Ty Simpson. If the offensive line doesn't get the job done, it does not matter. And oh, by the way, remember on Thursday morning, we saw the video of Nick Saban and his uh, his call-in show. And there was kind of a funny moment where he's talking about, uh, where he takes a call from somebody named Pee Wee. And Pee Wee's about to ask a question. And Nick Saban cuts him off and said, Pee Wee, I've been waiting to talk to you all week, man. Pee Wee. We, what is going on with us? And he essentially mentioned the offensive line. And so I think Nick Saban knew this was a problem. I think Nick Saban is struggling for answers like everybody else is. And I don't know if there's an answer. And oh, by the way, there is no reason for them to be so bad. JC Latham, left tackle or, or right tackle is a potential top 10 pick according to Mel Kuyper. Left tackle, Caden Proctor, five-star, future first rounder. They shouldn't be this bad, but they are. And so the question becomes, not only how does this get fixed, but how did we even get here, right? Like, I, you know, sometimes to move forward, you got to take a step back. And when I look at Alabama, this is what strikes me. How did we get here with this team? Now, part of it is, I don't think, based on what I've seen, any of the quarterbacks are good enough. Now, to be fair, I don't think it would matter, again, behind this offensive line. But, 
I do go back to something I said last week, and I do go back to something that I think is worth noting here. I think Nick Saban knew at the end of last season, there was no real heir apparent to Bryce Young. And that was why he made such a concerted effort to talk about getting back to physicality, get back to the run game, get back to toughness, because he knew for the first time in about seven, eight years, he didn't have a potential top 10 type pick at quarterback to carry the team. So that's part of it. I think he probably should have been more aggressive early in the early part of the transfer portal, something that we talked about again last week. Um, You know, the good quarterbacks were basically off the board by the middle of January. The Sam Hartmans, the Devin Leary, who has been very good for Kentucky early. I don't know if any of them would have considered Alabama, but I don't know why you wouldn't have. But Alabama was not aggressive. And it was only after spring ball when everybody struggled that that was when you got aggressive. But to me, you know what I believe the real problem is at Alabama? The real issue? I mean, it's the offensive line. But how do we get there? How do we get to this situation where the offensive line isn't good enough, the quarterbacks aren't good enough? I'll be blunt. I think part of it does fall on the coaching, specifically the assistant coaches. And it's interesting. I've heard this kind of narrative come up over the last couple weeks, but I do think it's worth noting here. And I think you can even go back to last year. I remember talking about on this show last year. I remember people asking like, why is Alabama? They don't look right. Because remember last year, everybody would sit there and say, well, you know, I mean, they lost to LSU on the final play and Tennessee on the final play. It's like, yeah, but they also beat Texas A&M on the final play of the game beat Texas in the final 30 seconds of that game. And so you go back to last year. I remember talking about this. I said, something isn't right. Something isn't being done Monday through Friday. And it is showing up on Saturdays when Alabama takes the field. And all I can really go back to, and I've heard other people, you know, in the media. So I'm not claiming this is my original idea, whatever. I've heard a lot of other people talk about it. I just don't know if the coaching is good enough right now, because think about, all of the great coaches that Saban had during the height of his success. Kirby Smart on defense was there forever. Lane Kiffin, Steve Sarkeesian. I think people forget this. Brian Dable, the New York Giants head coach, was Alabama's offensive coordinator for a year. Mario Cristobal, offensive line coach. Uh, Mel Tucker, defensive backs coach. Billy Napier was a wide receivers coach. I mean, we're talking about position coaches that now our head coaches in the SEC, the ACC, big time elite blue chip programs. Do you see that on Alabama staff right now? Now we're not going to go person for person, but Alabama's defensive coordinator is Kevin Steele. Again, I think the defense is actually pretty good, so I don't want to blame too much on him. He's also 65 years old. Is that, you know, like, like it, it feels like a blast from the past. Let's go back to something that worked 15 years ago. I think it speaks to, I don't think there was a long line to come coach that defense. By the way, Kevin Steele replaced a guy named Pete Golden. Pete Golden came from UTSA and Southern Miss. So it's not as though that guy was elite even before Kevin Steele. Oh, by the way, on offense, Tommy Reese. Listen, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but it's not like Notre Dame was lighting up the scoreboard when he was the offensive coordinator there. And I only bring it up because think about, again, the offensive coordinators, Lane Kiffin, Steve Sarkeesian. Does Tommy Reese feel like a guy that's a year or two away from being a big time college head coach? Cause I just don't see it. And so I go back to last year. I remember talking about this on the show. I said, there are entire position groups that need that, that need an overhaul. And you can't tell me that you misevaluated every single guy in the room, but last year it was wide receiver. They didn't have that dude offensive line. The defense was a little bit of a mess this year to their credit. The defense was, is much better this year. But this year, it's the quarterback room. It's the offensive line. And so that's all I can come back to. The coaching isn't good enough. And then bluntly, it leads to the most important question. Can this be fixed this year? Listen, I'm a guy that thought Alabama is going to win the SEC. They're going to get back to who they are. They might not win the championship, but I think they're good enough. And I don't know that we can can say, not only with any certainty, But I don't even know where the hope is that they can turn this thing around. And it's interesting because like on this show, one thing that I like to do, I always like to kind of present the situation, problem, solution. And if this happens, then that'll happen. If that happens, then that'll happen, right? 
Remember a year ago, talking about Jimbo Fisher. He needs to give up play calling. That'll help Texas A&M. We'll see if it ends up being correct. Um, in whatever, I'm just trying to think. Whatever sport, this is the problem. This is the solution. I don't know if Alabama can be fixed this year because offensive line, one, it's just not good enough. And the talent is there. And you've had eight or nine months to get better. And oh, by the way, you just got through the easy part of your schedule. Now, maybe Texas is way better than we thought, but South Florida, that should be like a 42 to three butt kicking, not a 17 to three hold on for dear life. And so that's where the concern is. The offensive line hasn't gelled. Um, You know, offensive lines generally as a position group take the longest to get it together. And so if they haven't yet, what hope do you have going forward? By the way, the schedule is about to get tougher. You start in the SEC next week, Ole Miss at home, and then it's go time. You got at AM in a couple weeks. You got, um, you know, whatever, at Auburn later in the year, LSU at home, Tennessee at home. It's not going to get easier, and I just don't know what the solution is. There's a saving grace. I think the defense is really good, and I really think Ty Simpson kind of showed me enough where I sit there and say if he has just a little bit of time, I think he can be pretty good. But the O-line needs to get fixed. It needs to get fixed quick. Or otherwise, this just might not be fixable next year, this year. Now, the good news is this is the portal era. By the way, I don't buy the whole Nick Saban is stepping aside stuff. He said late last week, you know, on Pat McAfee, it's laughable, the idea that I would leave college football. And the good news is in the portal era, um, you know, they have the number one quarterback coming in next year. But you're still talking about being two years away even if you like the quarterback coming in next year, I'm rambling. So I'll I'll cut myself off here. But the bottom line is I don't know what the solution is this year. And that's got to be so frustrating for an Alabama fan coming off last season. All right. So I'm going to do take a quick break. When I come back in something that I could have never imagined three, four weeks ago, we're going to go from Alabama to Colorado coach prime Deion Sanders. They improved to three and Oh, And I'll tell you, I learned one very interesting thing about them as they're about to hit the toughest part of their schedule. I explain that's next. I am back. Going to be back. Going to be back. Do want to switch gears. And I want to talk about a game. We just talked about Alabama, South Florida. I want to talk about a game that was basically the exact opposite of Alabama, South Florida. Alabama, South Florida had no vibe, no energy, weird weather, weird camera angles because the cameramen had to evacuate over the weather. And I bring it up because Colorado State, Colorado was essentially the exact opposite. It obviously had the lead, the, 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 the pregame hype with, first of all, the Jay Norvell coach prime back and forth. But then you had uh, college game day in town. You had Pat McAfee in town. You had uh big noon kickoff in town. You had Lil Wayne leading the team out of the tunnel. You had the rock on the sidelines. I saw Kawhi Leonard, I think, was there. Chauncey Billups was there. So it was a vibe. It was energy. And I'll say this, it was a wild, crazy back and forth game. Certainly one of the most entertaining games we've seen all year. And before we even get into the breakdown and the this and the that, let me say this. Doesn't that speak to who Coach Prime is and what he has already done, the interest that he has created in this, not only this program, but all of college football? That game, that energy, that vibe, it was like USC Pete Carroll on steroids, watching the game, sidelines, all of that. But let's get into the game. Let's talk about it. And really, when I think about the game, a couple things stand out. The first one is there was real bad blood in that stadium on Saturday night. Um, You know, we live in the world where everybody talks the talk. And then after the game, they want to take pictures and swap jerseys and do all that. No, there was real anger, real hostility. And it obviously translated onto the field where, of course, you know, let's let's call a spade a spade. Colorado State played kind of dirty, a lot of dirty. Not going to lie, not going to sugarcoat it. Travis Hunter gets knocked out. He goes to the hospital. Now, thankfully, he's okay. There was two or three just real, real, real cheap shots on Shador Sanders, including the one in overtime that knocked that guy out of the game uh, for the, you know, kind of the falling on top of Shador. Glad he's okay. But the one thing I will say is while it was dirty, while Colorado State had, what, 17 penalties, I think 163 yards, they were also kind of in control of that game. They jumped out to a lead early. They were not afraid all week long. They said, we don't care what they say about us in Boulder. They don't care if we hear us in Boulder. And they played like it. They knew it was their biggest game. They knew it was a national stage. They knew they had a chance. Hey, this is the biggest stage we're going to have all year. Let's go out and win that game. 
Let me say this though. That's also what made the decision by Jay Norvell on fourth and two late in the game. So jarring. And I think everybody knows the background, but for those of you who did not stay up until two 30 AM, and I'm guessing it was a lot of you wild decision by Jay Norvell. So they had been in control all game. They had the lead. They were up 28 to 21. They were on the Colorado side of the field, two minutes to go fourth and two. And they decided to punt the ball back to Shador Sanders, uh, to, to Colorado and to give the ball to Shador Sanders. And we're going to get into what Shador did in a minute. But I think that was the moment right there where they lost that game. Because to me, all week long, what was the entire vibe out of Colorado? Colorado State, excuse me. It was exactly what I just said. We're tired of hearing about them. We're not afraid of them. We're coming to play. We're coming to win. And it felt like every decision Jay Norvell made all week, starting on Wednesday night when he decided to call out Coach Prime, all the way through midway through late into the fourth quarter was about we're not, we're not playing scared. We're playing to win. So to punt the ball back up a touchdown with two minutes to go, when, if you get the first down, you can essentially ice the game. I don't know that I love that from Jay Norvell. And we all know what happened from there. Shador Sanders gets the ball. Shador Sanders drives Colorado the length of the field, 98 yards in about a minute 30. They force overtime and they end up winning in double overtime. Now, in terms of takeaways, a couple, couple things stand out. Um, from the Colorado perspective, listen, I give them a lot of credit, right? Because I, I thought last week, Nebraska, I wasn't really worried about the, the moment getting too big for them. Again, a lot of these guys came with Coach Prime from Jackson State. They were the biggest game. On, when they were at Jackson State, they were the biggest game on everybody's schedule. And so I didn't really worry about it last week against Nebraska. But this week, I don't know how you can't get overwhelmed by the hype. Like I said, it's not just that you're one and oh, it's not just that you're the biggest story in college football, but one, you have another coach talking about your coach. You have a situation where everybody's in town to see you. You have the sunglasses, you have the this, you have the that, you have all the interviews, all the media opportunities, all, and then it's game day and there's the rock and there's Lil Wayne. And even Shador Sanders mentioned in the post game, like, yeah, it was a lot to process. So I don't think it was Colorado's best effort, but you know what also stood out about this game to me? And I, and I think this is important. I think, I, I think really two things about Colorado finding a way to win stood out to me is that I think watching that game. And I was thinking about this during, you know, the moment in time where it felt like they were probably going to lose is I think because of the hype, because of the excitement, because of Coach Prime and everything he brings and all the celebrities and all that stuff, I think we're starting to forget how incredible this story is and how great of a job that Coach Prime has done. Because if you watch that game, the thing that st stood out was like, this Colorado team, they're a great story. And Shador Sanders is a first-round quarterback. And Travis Hunter, when he's not getting you know drilled in the chest illegally, is an, is an A-plus-plus athlete, the likes of which we've maybe never seen before. But this team also has a lot of holes, right? Especially early, middle of the game. Shador Sanders is back there getting killed. I mean, I saw a report from the stadium. They didn't even know if he was going to be able to go in the second half. He was limping. He was beat up. He was this. He was that. And it makes me realize this is still a program that is very much a work in progress. The offensive line isn't where it needs to be. Now, by the way, it shouldn't be. Remember, this was by far the worst team and the worst roster in college football last season. There was a reason that Coach Prime had to bring in 65, 70 new scholarship players, whatever the number ended up being. They weren't good. And so what I learned on Saturday was a couple things. Is one, first of all, Shador Sanders is a dog, man. Like, by the way, shout out to his brother, the pick six, all that. I don't want to dismiss Shiloh. I know that Coach Prime talked after the game about, you know, having a father moment there where he wasn't a coach. He was just a father. He was so proud of him for all his hard work. But from Shador Sanders' perspective, man, I'll tell you what. I give that kid so much freaking credit because he's playing in a game. The offensive line hasn't been great. I would argue the offensive line wasn't even great against Nebraska last week. We just didn't notice it because Jeff Simmons kept fumbling the ball and giving it back to Colorado. But I bring it up only because that game for Shador Sanders made me appreciate not only how talented he is, but how tough he is. Sometimes we know how it is, right? Coach's son, he's a quarterback, he's this, he's that. No, no, no. Shador Sanders got the crap kicked out of him and kept getting back up every single time. And so when I think about him as a player, newfound respect, I'll also say this. 
We haven't talked a ton about Shador as an NFL draft prospect. I don't know how an NFL team can't be thrilled to see the toughness that he brings because ultimately, let's be honest, Shador is going to be a high draft pick whenever he declares, and he's probably going to go to a bad team, and he's probably not going to have a great offensive line. And so you're seeing him now in adversity. This isn't like playing at Ohio State. This isn't like playing at Alabama where every where you have the best skill position, the best O-line, the best defense of every team that you're playing all year. Shador's getting his butt kicked back there, and he's getting up. I love to see it. But I think the other thing that I learned is kind of what I said a minute ago. We shouldn't move past, and we shouldn't forget to appreciate everything that Coach Prime has done in his short time as the Colorado coach. Because at the end of the day, when I think about this team, the thing that stands out, there's still a work in progress. And the schedule is going to get much tougher. And I know the people that are waiting for them to fail. Well, listen, you might have ammo. Oregon's a really good team next week. USC is a really good team in two weeks. But I don't think we should stop and not appreciate what he's already done. This was a team where their over under Vegas win total was three and a half coming into this year. They're three and oh right now. They're three and oh right now, which means all I got to do is beat a bad Arizona State team, bad Stanford team. You know, they're going to get to five wins. Question is, can they beat a UCLA? Can they beat an Oregon State? Somebody like that. But that's all for another day. And I'm not going to, you know, we got all week to break down the Oregon game this weekend and the bigger picture. I just think we have to appreciate how far this program has come. Because there's a lot of other programs that brought in a lot of transfers and the results haven't matched. Arizona State brought in a million transfers. They got destroyed by Fresno State at home on Saturday night. Um, You know, it hasn't clicked for a lot of other people as well. So what Coach Prime has done, what Colorado has done to be 3-0 and at this point, again, I get once they become the center of the sports world, it's easy to say, well, you know, let's see what happens against Oregon or USC. I don't think we have to wait that long. I think we need to appreciate it. They are a team. They are a work in progress. By the way, I was thinking about this. They're 3-0. and They're going to get bowl eligible. Um, I don't know what the ceiling is. We've talked about that before. But at the same time, keep this in mind as well. This is probably the least talented roster that Coach Prime will ever have. A lot of big-time recruits were in town on Saturday. A ton are expected two weeks from now for USC. And he's going to get those guys that he needs along the defensive line, linebacker, offensive line. We know he can recruit quarterbacks, wide receivers, corners, all of that. Give him time. Now that there's a proof of concept, he's going to get the guys needed. This is probably his least talented team. And in a season where they were expected to win three games, three and a half was their over under win total. They're three and oh. I don't think we should dismiss that, even if the coverage has been insane. All right, so what I want to do, take a quick break. When we come back, we will wrap on the rest of a busy Saturday in college football. I want to talk to Florida Gators. I want to talk a couple other games and notes that I saw. Take a quick break. We will be right back. All right, everybody. I'm back. Good to be back. Good to be back. Final segment of the show. So good to be back. Do want to go ahead and wrap uh, with just some odds and ends from the rest of college football. I think there was one marquee game, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then we'll get to some of the other kind of interesting results from Saturday. By the way, maybe even wrap with a thought or two on the NFL. Week two is going on right behind me. But let's focus on football. Let's focus on college football, I should say. And let's focus on what I thought bluntly was a very important game and a very important result that we got Saturday in the Swamp. Florida hosting Tennessee. We know that is a historically great rivalry. But I thought this going into this game, it was a very important game for both teams. Tennessee really largely took care of both of their opponents, Virginia and Austin P. early. Don't think that they looked great in either game, though. And so this was a statement opportunity. Your top 15 team on the road, go get the win. Florida, actually a home underdog and really on the field, hadn't had all that much to show in the Billy Napier era. Six and seven last year. Uh, you lose to Utah in week one. Off the field, recruiting is going pretty well, but on the field, you need to start getting results. And that's exactly what happened as Florida takes care of Tennessee. Final score, 29 to 16. Billy Napier might have just gotten his statement win. What stood out to me about this game, what I think is really important, for the first time on the field, I felt like I knew what Florida football's identity was, especially on offense. We know Billy Napier's background came from Louisiana. That's why some call him Sunbelt Billy. Uh, but came from Louisiana, called his own plays there, called his own plays at Florida. But through a year and change, I, I didn't really know, like, like what are they about? What are they doing? 
Last year, obviously, it's a little bit different. You do have Anthony Richardson, but offense is kind of up and down all off, uh, all season last year. You go to the bowl game without Anthony Richardson, it's an abomination. And then week one at Utah, it's an abomination. Struggle to move the ball, turnovers at the worst possible time, penalties at the worst possible time. It was just really bad. Saturday, though, is kind of the exact opposite. You fall down early, and to your credit, you don't get nervous, you don't get scared, you stick to the blueprint, and you find success. The blueprint was pretty obvious. We're going to run the ball, we're going to control the clock, we're going to keep Joe Milton and that Tennessee offense off the field. By the way, you don't need to be a college football expert to know that, to understand it. Billy Napier literally said it at his Monday press conference last week. Basically said, like, we can't let them do what they do, we can't let them get comfortable, or it could get out of hand. Well, after falling down early, Florida largely controlled the game. Fell down 7 nothing. How about this? They scored 29 of the next 32 points in that game. 173 yards of total offense. Graham or 100 excuse me, 173 yards rushing offense, almost 5 yards per carry, and then Graham Mertz, the transfer quarterback from Wisconsin, who at Wisconsin was a turnover machine could do nothing right. I thought he looked calm. I thought he looked poised. I thought he looked in control. 19 of 24 passing, one touchdown. And then once they got the lead, what was equally impressive is they just kept the ball away from Tennessee. I think this is worth noting. These new clock rules, they very much played to Florida's advantage on Saturday night, and I think that was part of the game plan. Get the lead, take the air out of the ball with this moving clock. Remember, college football now has this NFL clock where first downs do not stop the clock except under two minutes, that was Florida's game plan. And so they controlled the the, the line of scrimmage. They controlled tempo. They controlled time of possession. I think the final stats were 37 minutes and change that Florida had the ball. Joe Milton in Tennessee just could not get the ball, could not make enough plays, fell behind, and could not catch up. Now, in terms of the bigger picture, let me say this. I think there is no doubt in my mind that this is the signature win of the Billy Napier era and potentially a program-changing win going forward. I know they opened with a win last year against Utah, but that was, I'm not going to say it was fluky. They deserved to win. But after that, basically just about everything else went wrong. Finished five and seven after that game. Um, And really it was just, just a lot of bad, right? Again, you didn't have an identity. You lost to all four teams that you consider to be a rival. Last year, lost to Tennessee, lost to Georgia, lost to LSU, lost to Florida State. Some of those games weren't even close. And it is just really, really, really ugly. By the way, off the field, we talked about it. Billy Napier was the first coach I've ever seen. His fan base was frustrated with him before he ever even coached a game because of some of the recruiting stuff. You lose Jaden Rashada to Miami. You get him back. Then you lose him over the whole NIL fiasco. And I'll sit here and say this. I talked to some Florida fans this week, and I talked to some people kind of in Gainesville. I think if Billy Napier had lost this game, I don't know. I'm not saying you could have never gotten the fan base back. I think it would have been pretty tough, though, because at that point, you lose to another rival. At that point, you're one and two. At that point, you're only wins at McNeese State, and it's not as though the schedule gets easier. You still have at Kentucky, at LSU, Florida State at home. There are no easy games on this schedule. And so to get this win, I really do think it builds momentum and really may be a program kind of changing victory. It's for a few reasons. One, you proved you can win the big games. And we don't know how Tennessee is. We'll talk about them momentarily. But you had to have that signature win. By the way, it's not just about this year. Remember, loaded 2024 class. You got to hold them together. You got to show something on the field that there's a proof of concept that this could potentially work. Well, now you had a lot of those kids in attendance on Saturday. They see what the swamp is like on a crazy Saturday night. You get the win. You show them you can win big games. You show them there is a plan. I think that's huge. I also think it's huge because that particular game plan is largely replicable. Now, I'm not saying you're going to beat LSU, and I'm not saying you're going to beat Florida State. I don't even know if you can go to Kentucky and win in two weeks. We'll we'll talk about that game here uh, you know, in time. But at the same time, That game plan is replicable. Control the line of scrimmage, get ahead, run the football, don't make mistakes. You just do that, you can win a lot of games and, again, build some momentum for next year. 
So I don't want to get too crazy. This is still very much a process. Georgia is still the best team in the SEC East. Not saying this means that Florida is going to win a national championship, win the SEC East, none of that. But you needed some type of positive something on the field. Recruiting is great. And recruiting, I think, was largely going to save Billy Napier one way or another, no matter how bad this season went. But now you got a little bit of a signature win. You got a little bit of a momentum. You got a little bit of a monkey off your back. Can they continue it? They play Charlotte this weekend uh, at Kentucky two weeks from now. Man, oh, man, oh, man, did Billy Napier need this win. From the Tennessee perspective, you know, I, I don't really know what to say. I know that Tennessee fans, oh, here we go again. I know a lot of the national pundits, oh, last year was just a total fluke. They stink this year. I don't really know that I saw that. Like I said, it was clear the entire Florida blueprint was to keep that Tennessee uh, offense off the field, and they largely did it. And so ultimately, I'll be honest, I don't know if Joe Milton's the guy. I don't think Saturday night was the night that we definitively learned that or not. It's hard for me to say that. Joe Milton, I, I, I don't think he's great. I don't think he's perfect. But again, what did I just tell you? Time of possession in that game. Florida was in complete control. 37-28 compared to 22-32. Joe Milton was not great, 20 of 34, but he did throw for 287 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. You think, By the way, you think Alabama wouldn't take a performance like that? Um, I thought Tennessee, again, they just couldn't get into a rhythm in part because of those clock rules. And so I'm not ready to give up on the season, but the one thing I will say from Tennessee's perspective is this. Got to clean up the penalties. And this was the concern coming in. Last couple of weeks, they've been a little sloppy. It did not look good. Josh Heupel tried to play it down. It's not a big deal. It doesn't matter. We're going to get this stuff cleaned up. Well, you didn't. It was a sloppy, sloppy, sloppy performance. 10 penalties, 79 yards, none bigger than you're starting to finally build some momentum late in the fourth quarter, trying to, you know, whatever, get back in the game. Florida has the ball. They have not scored in the second half at this point. Um, and you're trying to stop them on a, on a fourth down, right? What ends up happening? They line up, try to get you to draw you off sides. That's exactly what happened. New set of downs. The game is basically over from there. So I'm not ready to give up, but you got to clean that up. And I think you just, you, I think, I think that's basically it. You got to clean it up and you got to decide who, who you are. Are you undisciplined? Are you a team that beats bad teams and loses to good teams? I don't know. I'm not going to sit there and say in front of 90,000 people at the swamp because you did not win that game, your season is over. The good news for Tennessee, by the way, next three games are at home and next three games are all winnable for the Vols. Uh, in terms of that schedule, te uh, UTSA, that's obviously Texas San Antonio next week, then South Carolina, then a bye, then Texas A&M. So next time you go on the road is not until October 21st, over a month from now when you go to Alabama. Get right, win these three games, be 5-1 and one going into Alabama. I didn't love what I saw on Saturday, but I don't think it's a season is over type thing. But again, are you going to get your stuff cleaned up? Are you going to limit penalties? All that, that is important for Tennessee. They fall to 2-1 and one on the season. Really quickly, some other results. One, I think we got to give LSU some credit, right? LSU gets destroyed by Florida State in week one, and they did the destroying on Saturday, 41 to 14, the final score at Mississippi State. Now, look, I think part of that, I think Mississippi State's a mess. Again, we talked about on Friday's show, RIP Mike Leach. It's, it's, it's a tragic situation around that program, but they hired the defensive coordinator, promoted him from within, and two things stood out on Saturday. One, as I told you, They've gone away from the Mike Leach air raid offense. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. You have one of the most prolific quarterbacks in college football, and Will Rogers don't understand why you would do that. Two, here's the bigger problem. If you're going to switch up the offense to play more complimentary football, you got to get stops on defense. It was one of the most pathetic defensive performances that I have seen all year. 287 yards passing from Jaden Daniels, 30 of 34 passing. I don't want to discredit what he did. But when Malik Neighbors, the LSU wide receiver, has 239 yards receiving on the same go route, you know, it was it was a hitch and go. It was a stop and start and go. Like, that is really bad for Mississippi State. So, again, don't think it's a great sign that you hire the defensive coordinator. The, def the defense is a mess. We'll see what happens with Mississippi State. But from LSU, listen, I think it's positive 
I think you got some momentum now. You look at the SEC West, I'll be honest, it is not very good. Um, I am not sold on AM, even though they won the other day. Obviously, Arkansas loses at home to uh to BYU. Ole Miss struggled a lot against Georgia Tech. Alabama, we've spoken about. We'll see about Auburn in the coming weeks. I think LSU's probably got to be considered the favorite right now. They take care of business against Mississippi State. Jaden Daniels with a career performance. Other games of note. Uh, Florida State survived against Boston College. I'm not worried. Weird game. Look ahead game. Clemson next week on the road. You got to go to Boston College first. That is not an easy ask. They survive. They get the win. Don't really, not worried that it it wasn't pretty. Thought Ohio State actually looked really good. And I know everyone's going to say, oh, they played only Western Kentucky. Well, here's the thing. Western Kentucky is a crazy prolific offense. And Ohio State won 63 to 10 and really limited Western Kentucky in what they did, holding them to 284 yards of total offense. I'll tell you, that Ohio State defense looked really, really, really good to me. I think they have a chance to go to Notre Dame and win. I would have picked Notre Dame going into the week. I think they can do it because I think the defense is much, much, much improved. A lot of speed and athleticism in the back seven. Fascinating matchup with Notre Dame this weekend. Keep it going. Georgia 24 to 14 against South Carolina. South Carolina was up 14 to three at halftime. Georgia flips the switch. I haven't been sold on Georgia all off season. I'm a little bit worried about them, but they did what they had to do. I think the big thing for Georgia, my question is you can flip a switch against South Carolina, but as you get into the week out week in week out sec grind, how do you handle things? UAB next week before going to Auburn on the 30th of September. And then you get Kentucky at home. By the way, Spencer Rattler, man, like he took a lot of shrapnel. He took a lot of, what do they call them, uh, uh, side bullets or whatever. He, you know, he took a lot of bullets when he was at Oklahoma. I think he has developed into a really good college quarterback. I feel bad that his whole situation is the way that it is. South Carolina's, their offensive line is really bad. Their run game is really bad. And he just gets back there and gets killed. But I think he is a turn into a really good college quarterback, 258 yards passing. Unfortunately, he did throw two interceptions, but it was because they basically had to throw on every single play. A couple other results. Let's give some quarterbacks some credit. Dylan Gabriel from Oklahoma. Listen, I was a little high on Oklahoma coming into the year. Remember, I said last year they lost seven games. Five of them were by one touchdown or less. Four of them were by a field goal. The only two times they got blown out were when Dylan Gabriel was hurt and not playing. That was against TCU and that was against Texas a year ago. Well, through two games or through three games this year, he is completing 82% of his passes, 11 touchdowns, one interception, 11 yards per completion. Oklahoma puts up 66 points against Tulsa yesterday. Uh, They win 66 to 17. Remember they beat Butch Jones and Arkansas state 73 to nothing a few weeks ago. They now open Big 12 play next week. Remember, Cincinnati is now a Big 12 team. They get Oklahoma in their season opener at Cincinnati. Big noon kickoff. That'll be the first national stage for Oklahoma, but I could not be more impressed. By the way, we're going to have to do a big where Aaron was wrong on the Washington Huskies. Michael Penix goes to East Lansing, 719 yards of total offense. Michael Penix in this game, the quarterback, 473 yards, four touchdowns on the season. These are Michael Penix's overall stats, 1,300 yards through three games. Not great at math, but that's like 450 yards per game. 12 touchdowns, one interception, 12 yards per completion. The Washington Huskies are for real. They open Pac-12 play next week uh, versus Cal at home. That'll be a Pac-12 after dark game. So credit to those guys. Remember, Aaron Torres online. We do our stock watch, our Heisman watch every Monday. I think Penix and Dylan Gabriel are both guys that are shooting way up. I think that's really it. Don't know if I gave Missouri credit for the 61-yard walk-off field goal, but they get the win there. By the way, how about this? Missouri, the only SEC team so far this season to beat a top 25 team out of conference. Alabama didn't do it against Texas. Uh, floor, uh, LSU didn't do it against Florida State. AM gets destroyed by Miami. How about the Missouri Tigers? 
saving the entire integrity of the SEC with the win over Kansas State. I think that's really it. I think that's really it. I'll tell you what, let's get out of here on that because – we got ourselves a jam-packed week on the Aaron Torres pod. Remember, we have a mega, mega, mega weekend next weekend. We have Notre Dame hosting Ohio State, Colorado at Oregon, um, Clemson hosting Florida State. We got a lot of stuff uh, to get in on this week. So make sure you subscribe to the Aaron Torres pod and also make sure that you are following on YouTube. As I said, I think that's it for this episode of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. It is time for me to get out of here. You already know the details. If you're not subscribed to the show, please make sure to do so. Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure you're subscribed. Also, make sure to rate and review the show on Apple. Give us a quick five stars. Leave us a review. That helps us move up the charts. Then on YouTube, make sure that you're subscribed. Like this video really does help us on YouTube as well. And I think that's it. Make sure you're subscribed on the YouTube channel. We'll have some bonus content there throughout the week. Otherwise, for this show, I'll be back on Wednesday. Shout out to Torn Craig. Shout out to Rachel, who hates my voice. Shout out to JJ Reddick, you F-head. Unblock me, bro. Hey, do me a favor. Help control the pet population. Have your pet spayed or neutered. RIP Bob Barker. Be back on Wednesday. Have a great week, everybody. Aaron Torres Podcast.